Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 31 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and the moderator of the forum. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. E.J. Dion is a columnist for the Washington Post, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a university professor in the Foundations of Democracy and Culture at Georgetown University. He serves as a political commentator for National Public Radio for MSNBC and NBC's Meet the Press, and his twice-weekly op-ed column is syndicated in 140 newspapers. He is the author or editor of numerous books, including Why Americans Hate Politics, which was nominated for a National Book Award, and his newest book, Our Divided Political Heart, which is the topic of tonight's presentation. Mr. Dion spoke once before at the Town Hall Forum in the presidential election year of 1966. <laughs> when Bill Clinton and Bob Dole were the candidates, and we're grateful. We're grateful he has returned this election year again for a long overdue visit. I'm sure he'll have some prognostications for us about the upcoming election. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, E.J. Dion. Thank you. The uh, pastor and I actually met in Lincoln's 1864 uh, campaign. Uh, we go back a very, very long way. Uh, did you notice, by the way, how his wonderful preacher voice suddenly changed to a golden voice of radio as soon as that uh, signal came up? Um, that was such a generous uh, introduction. It was so much nicer than the introduction I received once, which ended and now, for the latest dope from Washington, here's E.J. Dion. So thank you very, very much, uh, very, very much for that. It's a real honor uh, to be part of a great tradition of this church. Um, and indeed, I think this uh, forum um, is very representative of the state of Minnesota, which has given the nation so many uh, gifts, the gifts of good government, civic engagement, social justice, and Norwegian charisma. Um, it's, um, in fact, it, it is one of your great parishioners, Walter Mondale, who invented the term uh, Norwegian charisma, and he is a very, very, very dear man. Um, it's also very nice and charitable of you to uh, invite a journalist. We are not the most popular profession, although I always say thank God for lawyers and investment bankers. Um, the, um, you may, um, you know, you, we sort of have a reputation of arrogance, which you might, for arrogance, which you might say we work pretty hard at. Uh, but these days, as many of you have seen in your newspapers or online, there are those little uh, email addresses underneath, and people actually write us uh, quite often. And for some reason, they write us more when they disagree than when they agree. I think this might have something to do with original sin, but I won't preach on that uh, today. Um, one of the um, uh, negative emails that I always like that I can actually repeat in this holy place um, began with the words, Dear Mr. Dion, are you as dumb in person? And if you get Nothing else out of my talk tonight, you'll be able to answer that question uh, for yourself. Um, I want to talk a bit on my uh, new book, Our Divided Political Heart, which I cannot resist at the outset. Uh, it talks a lot about our founding fathers. It would make an excellent Father's Day uh, gift. Um, and uh, it's a lot about the tensions uh, in us as Americans. And it's a book in, in many ways about who we are. Uh, and we Americans are actually a very uh, confusing people, uh, perhaps especially to ourselves. 
the self-portraits we create are often contradictory. Uh, the products of our culture all seem to celebrate uh, conflicting values. Is our country better, better personified by the communitarianism of Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, or the rogue individualism of Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry? Does Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land or Frank Sinatra's My Way speak more directly to who we are? Um, is the American experiment unique because it, rec it recognized the limits of individual accomplishment, something sometimes illustrated in John Steinbeck novels, or because it acknowledges the sanctity of independence as celebrated, say, by Jack Kerouac? Um, our divided political heart grew out of my love for the American story uh, and its tensions. Uh, there's a paradox right at the beginning of the book uh, because the first sentence refers to widespread worries about American decline, um, which I think have been uh, very important to our politics uh, in recent years. Um, but the book is very distinctly not in a declinist book. It's an anti-declinist book. It's actually a hopeful book about our future because it argues that the classic American balance between individualism and community and also between government and the market and between private and public uh, helped us get out of scrapes before and, and has done so again and again. Uh, I never tire of quoting Winston Churchill, who offered my very favorite take on us as Americans. Americans, he said, can always be counted on to do the right thing after they have exhausted all other possibilities. Um, it takes us time, but we get there. Um, and uh, Churchill actually noticed something that that great student of 19th century student of American life, Ale uh, Alex de to uh, de Alexis de Tocqueville noticed uh, when he talked about our extraordinary capacity uh, for self-correction. Uh, indeed, the fact that we talk so much about our decline uh, is a sign of what a high opinion we have of our country because we always seem to think that we are in a place from which we can uh, decline. And out of our fears, it's true, um, and out of our fears of decline have come some extraordinary political moments. Uh, feelings of decline usually start in specific crises in foreign policy or economics, uh, or as was the case at the end of the Bush administration, both. But these concerns quickly uh, morph into a sense that we are in the midst of something larger, a spiritual cri crisis. And that's when we start asking ourselves who we are, uh, who are we? Um, we debate history and history's lessons, and we disagree on what they are. Uh, Barack Obama's election, I think, was very much rooted in a sense that he was the person to solve a kind of spiritual crisis that affected the country. Uh, his very campaign was geared toward this crisis. Remember those posters carrying that single word hope and that change we can believe in poster uh, slogan. I have always thought that the word believe was at least as important uh, as the word change in that Obama slogan and it is no wonder that his campaign so often felt like a religious uh, crusade. Uh, so it's no accident that the Tea Party also responded to this sense of spiritual crisis by reaching back to our founders and the Constitution. And my book, it should be said, is in some ways inspired by the Tea Party, uh, even as it is quite critical of their view of who we are and quite critical of their take on the American story. I thank the Tea Party at the beginning of the book, in fact, because they were right to go back to the origins of our country. And those of us who are progressive, as I think of myself, I think need to have an argument with them. Uh, we progressives, I think, have been too willing to leave the argument about American history to the right. We have been too, willing, uh, uh, too unwilling to embrace the American story, which I believe is at heart a progressive story. Should our conservative friends be the only people who carry copies of the Constitution around in their pockets? Why do we leave quoting the Federalists to conservatives? Why do we leave the Declaration uh, to them? Uh, the most forward-looking politicians and moral spokesmen in our history did not do that. Uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech drew its inspiration from the promises of American history and in the particular promises of our Declaration of Independence. 
Dr. King spoke of a promissory note that had been handed to African Americans that had come back stamped unpaid insufficient funds. It was a very powerful way to make his case, and he was making his case from our history. Abraham Lincoln's most important political speech before he was president was his speech at Cooper Union in New York City, where he insisted that the founders of our nation ultimately foresaw, as he did, the eventual extinction of slavery in the United States. Lincoln did months of historical research to give a speech that the historian Harold Holzer believes made him president. What do I mean by a divided political heart? Uh, the core argument of my book is that from the very beginning, Americans have been torn by a deep but healthy tension between our love of individualism and our affection for community. Too often, and especially in recent years, I think, we have told our story almost entirely on the individualistic side. We have emphasized individual liberty to the exclusion of our dedication to community and also to equality, a value we argue about in every generation. We have not focused enough on how the liberty we prize depends upon the willingness to come to the defense of each other's liberty, how liberty depends upon strong community, energetic government, and a concern for the common good. Consider the very first word of the Constitution of the United States. It's not the word I, uh, it's not the word individual, it's not the word liberty, it's the word we. Uh, in the preamble uh, to our Constitution, it goes, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic, domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Yes, welfare is in the first paragraph of the Constitution. Uh, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Again, ourselves and our posterity. Uh, do we do ordain and establish this Constitution? The Declaration of Independence is a perfect reflection of the balance between individualism and community. It begins by describing those unalienable rights that come from our creator, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the founders pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. They understood that we cannot protect individual liberty unless we act together. Uh, we've had a parallel argument related to the role of government in our history. I had a lot of fun in this book going back through the legacies of Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay and Abraham Lincoln and also the populist and progressives uh, legacies. Uh, for those of you who might uh, listen to David Brooks and me on the radio on uh, NPR, I told David that one of the joys of writing this book was finally to figure out why he was utterly crosswise to current American politics. He is the last surviving American Whig through and through. Um, and in fact, both of us have a certain affection for the Whigs, and a friend suggested we could organize the most boring event in American history, which would be called Whigstock. Um, uh, um, if you believe that the federal government played a little role in the development of our country, you have to write, among others, Clay, Hamilton, and Lincoln, and a lot of other people out of the story entirely. If you believe that the Constitution is absolutely clear and can be read only one way, then you have to deal with the fact that within three years of the enactment of that document, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, its two leading interpreters in the Federalists, were at each other's throats over whether the federal government had under the Constitution the right to establish a Bank of the United States. My chapter on the Constitution is called One Nation Conceived in Argument. Uh, and I could not resist quoting my friend, the legal scholar Garrett Epps, who said that Justice Scalia and other originalists who root uh, their jurisprudence in what they call originalism seem to be saying, I knew the founders, the founders were friends of mine. I know how they think. Um, but actually, the Constitution was created out of a series of compromises, including some we would very much disapprove of today, as on slavery. Um, it defends competing values, as former Justice David Souter has said. And I think we do ourselves a disservice 
to think that the founders were unique or sainted and received the constitutions as tablets from the heavens. Yes, they were gifted men, and we have a lot of reasons to be grateful to them. But they were also adventurous, embarking on a radical experiment for their time, rooted in the idea that a people could govern themselves. To think of the Constitution as a set of shackles designed to keep our country in exactly the same condition it was in 1787, and to prevent us from addressing new problems in new ways, does a disservice to the bold and adventurous nature of our founders. Uh, Hamilton and Clay, for their part, were visionaries. They advocated uh, what uh, might be called national planning. Henry Clay called his program the American system. And what's intriguing is that he called it the American system to distinguish it from the British system, which he said was rooted in laissez-faire economics. The American system, as conceived by Clay, was an alternative to pure laissez-faire because he believed the government had a major role to play in building our country. Uh, the Club for Growth would not be pleased with Clay. Um, Clay favored a strong federal role in launching internal improvements, which sounds so much nicer than the word infrastructure. Um, if my book accomplishes nothing else, I'd love to replace the word infrastructure with internal improvements. It is the same way to, re as it's the same thing, referring to the bridges and canals and road roads um, that fostered commerce and bound our nation together. Clay foresaw, as Hamilton did, an important role for the federal government in building us up as a manufacturing nation. He was more than a century ahead of Richard Nixon in proposing what we came to call federal revenue sharing for the states. And while we should not dragoon history too much into today's political arguments, I suspect Clay might have had some sympathy for President Obama's stimulus proposals, particularly aid to the states and the investment in infrastructure, new technologies, and spending uh, for education. Um, in frustration once, when Clay's opponents were saying his program was unconstitutional, particularly his effort to help uh, American manufacturing, he said, do we live in the only country in the world with a constitution that is written for other countries but not for ourselves?" Uh, and so, like many progressives later on, including FDR, Clay and others uh, expressed frustration with those who did not see the Constitution as a liberating document. Um, I argue that our friends in the Tea Party are looking back to an exceptional period in our history and turning it into the typical period. Um, the, it is the one period when a kind of radical individualism, as opposed to balanced American individualism, uh, predominated. Uh, and that was the period of the Gilded Age, the 35 years that run roughly from the Civil War to the ascension of Teddy Roosevelt to the White House. And this radical individualism did have enormous effect. Uh, it had great effect on Supreme Court decisions, for example. It's in this period when corporations were declared people, um, an idea I think Stephen Colbert got at best uh, when he said, that I want my daughter to grow up to marry a nice corporation. <laughs> um, uh, and it's, it's also in that period, uh, or in the aftermath of that period, that the Lochner decision was made uh, in 1905, um, which said the federal government couldn't regulate the, the hours or conditions of workers. Uh, fortunately, the court revisited that uh, and overturned it. I think the court wants to move back in that direction now. Um, and this gives me a different view of the populists and progressives than some uh, might have. Um, and I write a lot about both of them. Um, they, um, they are often seen now as the creators of some brand new big government approach, uh, whereas I see them as restoring the American tradition of balance between government and the market. Um, that dominated uh, our country for 200 of our 235 years. Herbert Crowley, the great progressive thinker who influenced Teddy Roosevelt, argued that progressives sought to use Hamiltonian means to serve Jeffersonian ends. 
They wanted to, an, to use an active federal government to ensure greater uh, equality of opportunity, um, a healthier economy, and an economy not dominated by the trusts or by a very small number of people. Those who are looking in, for encouragement in our current debates can go back to some of the things that both Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson said about trusts and concentrated economic power. Uh, some of their quotations make it sound like Roosevelt and Wilson hung around at Occupy Wall Street encampments. Uh, it's quite astonishing how strong their rhetoric was. Um, if we have always sought a balance uh, between uh, individualism and community, we have also seen a balance between in, uh, the state and the market. And we have used government to check concentrated private power, even as we have used constitutional means to check untrammeled government power. Again, it's the idea of balance uh, and a sense of power balancing off power. I said at the outset uh, that my book uh, is uh, anti-declinist, uh, and it is. I think that what we are groping toward right now is a politics that again reflects this balance. I think that what we are seeing among our conservative friends at the moment uh, is an attempt to overturn the long consensus under which we have governed ourselves since Teddy Roosevelt's uh, day, um, a, 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 a period uh, in which we saw government playing the kind of role that Clay Hamilton and Lincoln envisioned, um, and also uh, with some expansions to take into account uh, the new conditions of, uh, of a capitalist economy. Uh, and so I think that if we restore this balance, um, restoring this balance is the best uh, recipe uh, for ending our feelings of decline. Um, I, I said also at the outset that we progressives should uh, um, embrace our history. Uh, think of how much progressive change has happened. Uh, we first extended the franchise from property owners to all white men. We eventually expanded the franchise to African Americans after the Civil War, took it away, and then after years of struggle, African Americans won it back. We extended the franchise to women. We created much broader uh, economic opportunity. If the Whigs and the Hamiltonians helped us in understanding the importance of a strong federal government, the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians reminded us of the importance of equality and democracy. And so I think today we have an obligation to our republic, uh, to the generations who came before us, and to those who will come after uh, to keep this republic and preserve our traditional balance. Now, I think when you get to be my age, the temptation is to kind of cranky views about the new generation, and since I don't want to admit I'm my age, uh, I actually have an extraordinarily positive view of the generation coming up. I believe that this new generation is unusually well-suited to keep this American promise uh, to balance. It is at once one of the most individualistic and one of the most communitarian generations uh, in our history. It is a generation that is more tolerant than any of the other generations. It is a generation more comfortable uh, with technology than those of us who came to Twitter at age 60. Uh, and yet they use the new technology and quickly form social networks. They are accustomed to the entrepreneurial society in which we live, and yet this generation has devoted more time to service than any other that has come along uh, for a long time. And it is not just, as the cynics say, that they had to do it to get out of high school or because they wanted to get into college. The fact is that service transforms individuals and turns them into transformative generations. Um, this is what happened to our greatest generation, and this, I believe, is what will happen uh, with them. I want to close by making two points. One is to go back to our declaration, and then the other is to close uh, by, um, by having a reverie on John Winthrop and Bruce Springsteen, and you, I will explain to you what they have uh, in common. Um, because, partly because I was writing this book and partly because of the Tea Party, um, I actually went back one July 4th weekend um, to carefully and slowly read the Declaration in its entirety. And many of you remember who read the Declaration or heard it recited every year on NPR, actually, um, that there is a long list of abuses and usurpations, as Jefferson called them, 
um, uh, explaining why we were revolting against the king. Um, a, a few interesting uh, facts on this. Uh, taxes did not come up until the 17th item uh, of, that, of that list. And the item was neither a complaint about tax rates nor an objection to the idea of taxation. Our founders were mad simply because the Crown had imposed taxes on us without our consent. Their point was about consent and not taxes. Uh, the very first item on their list condemned the king because he refused to assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. Note that the signers wanted to pass laws, not repeal them, and they began by speaking of the public good, not individuals. The second grievance reinforced the first, accusing the king of having forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. Again, our forebears wanted to enact laws that were not anti-government zealots. Uh, abuses uh, nine, uh, three through nine also referred in some way to how laws were passed and how justice was administered. And the document really didn't get to anything like big government oppression until item number 10. And I want to tell my anti-government friends that if you want to have anti-government rhetoric, it ought to sound like this. Uh, Jefferson wrote, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out, our, eat out their substance. They knew how to do rhetoric in those days. <laughs> Lastly, Springsteen and John Winthrop. John Winthrop, as many of you know, um, gave the uh, sermon or speech that uh, Ronald Reagan used to like to quote when he talked about a shining city on a hill. Uh, in 1630, uh, John Winthrop gave uh, a speech entitled A Model of Christian Charity. Um, and here is what he said. He said, we must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our community as members of the same body. Now, is there any doubt that Rush Limbaugh would have called this great Puritan a socialist? <laughs> and then there's Bruce Springsteen. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the new Bruce Springsteen album, but the very first song on that album, I think, is a rather condensed and economical version of the John Winthrop sermon. The refrain in that song is, wherever this flag is flown, we take care of our own. And so, from 1630 to 2012 with Bruce Springsteen, we have this concern for the community and the common good. Now, if you suspect that I am wrapping myself in Springsteen in an effort for a modest writer to get some of the sales from Bruce Springsteen's fans, <laughs> you would be absolutely right. Um, <laughs> but I think it's very important that, uh, that Winthrop and Springsteen were saying this. I think they were speaking to some of the, that were the very best things about us, the thing that makes us Americans. I want us to celebrate the American community again with, uh, with Springsteen and Winthrop, uh, and I believe our country will be better off for doing so. Thank you very much. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker tonight is Washington Post columnist and author of the new book, Our Divided Political Heart, E.J. Dion. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank the Hennepin County Library for their co-sponsorship of tonight's forum, made possible with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. And now, Mr. Dion, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. <laughs> 
First one has to do with the uh, nature of democracy. It's been said that democracy is not just an external form of government, but an interior attitude or way of being. Would you comment on this? I think whoever wrote that question is a very close student of John Dewey. I wish I could see you identify uh, yourself because that's a very John Dewey view of democracy. He talked about democracy as a way of life. I very much feel that way myself. I, I agree with this, with the thrust of the question entirely. Um, I don't think de democracy is a form of government. Elections are central to it. Um, and the, the ability, uh, free speech is central to it, incidentally. One of the, uh, I write quite a lot in the book about the Citizens United decision and I ask the basic question, uh, how can you have uh, free speech if one side owns the microphone? Um, but, I, I, but I think that democracy is about... <laughs> of course, I don't mind it when the Westminster Church owns the microphone. Um, <laughs> The, um, but I think democracy is very much about our attitude toward each other. It's about a kind of egalitarianism in the way um, we treat each other. It's a kind of basic respect. It's one of the reasons in the book why I, I never liked it when um, a sort of liberals condescend to people who disagree with them or coastal people, and I grew up in Massachusetts, um, coastal people use terms like flyover country. Uh, for goodness sake, uh, those states in flyover country were among the most progressive states uh, in our union, uh, the fountainhead of populism. Um, and so I think we should, uh, when we are, um, when we think of ourselves as small d Democrats, we should behave as small d Democrats in our relations with each other. Several questions about the Supreme Court. What impact does the current distrust of the Supreme Court's objectivity have on our justice system? Any long-term consequences if they overturn the health care law? And will the Citizens United decision destroy our democracy? Ah. Um, the Supreme Court's objectivity, it sounded for a second like an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, um, in the book, I talk about Bush v. Gore and Citizens United as kind of bookends uh, of, I believe, a, a move away from democracy. Put aside what people felt for partisan or other reasons about uh, Bush v. Gore, I still don't understand why recounting ballots somehow violates the Constitution of the United States. Um, but what's really, um, what, yeah, I, I, there are some of us who just won't get over it, I know. Um, <laughs> But what really is troublesome about that decision is there, there's some really anti-democratic language in there that, um, you know, and the, the, the justices in the majority say, in one sense rightly, that it is still the case that under the Constitution the individual voter does not have the right to vote for president. That's what the language uh, says. Um, and what it ignores is uh, about 150 years of democratic development. It is true that at the beginning of the Republic, the electors were elected by state legislatures, and it was only over time that the people in the states voted for their electors. Uh, but this was part of a great democratic advance. It included ultimately um, the, um, uh, the election of uh, senators by popular vote instead of by the legislature. And so much of the thinking behind Bush v. Gore uh, 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 seems like a pushback against democracy. And so it is um, with Citizens uh, United. Um, it is very distressing that the original case brought to the court didn't even raise the issues that Citizens United ended up deciding. In fact, uh, as Justice Stevens put it in his dissent, uh, the majority had to change the case in order to change the law. They were overturning at least 30 years of precedent. They were effectively overturning practice going all the way back to uh, 1907 when the Tillman Act um, was passed. Um, and I think, the, uh, as uh, Justice Stevens said again, um, to treat corporations as persons in this uh, context um, is absurd because corporations have no feelings, no commitments, no consciences. Uh, they are not persons. They don't even vote in an election. Um, and I think that the imbalance of money in our uh, system is very, very dangerous. And again, it has that Gilded Age uh, feel to it. I don't think um, a small number of billionaires should have that much more power than the average citizen in a country that believes in one man, one vote.
Thank you. I should correct myself. One person, one vote. Pardon me. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. I was going to do it for you. I knew you were sharp. I don't want to, I want to try to stay ahead of you by a little bit. Let's talk health care. Several people have asked about the consequences if the Supreme Court overturns the health care law. Your comments? Um, partly it depends on how they overturn it. I mean, I very much hope they don't overturn it. Uh, I think that we have been struggling for a very long time to extend health coverage to all Americans. I think it's immoral that we don't have uh, health coverage uh, for all Americans. Um, It's a real blessing to appear before a friendly audience. Thank you. Um, uh, and and, and it's, it is very peculiar because we are the only rich country in the world that doesn't do this. And there are many different ways to get to universal uh, coverage. And while the Affordable Care Act is not perfect, there is no legislation that's perfect, but it is based on a whole series of compromises, so is the original Social Security Act. Uh, and so if we take this, if we reverse this forward step, I think it would be a terrible uh, thing for the country. Um, uh, the, I think the court could do a number of things. They could strike down the whole act, uh, or they could just strike down the individual mandate. If they just struck down the mandate and tried to left the rest of the law there, uh, the law doesn't really work uh, fully without, parts of the law do, but the, the law as a whole doesn't work without the mandate. I think at least that would force Congress to act. I worry if they toss the whole thing uh, to gather the energy uh, and the support to pass another uh, try at uh, something approaching universal coverage is just not going to happen anytime soon. And I know there's a big pundit argument over uh, whether uh, President Obama would be hurt or helped by this. There's a line of argument that says, well, he could go after the court. Uh, all the problems in the healthcare system then fall onto the uh, uh, Republicans, or he's saved from an unpopular law, at least judging by some of the polls. I just think it would be a real defeat for him because it is the singular uh, domestic achievement of his uh, uh, first term, and I think it would be uh, a severe, uh, a severe setback. And I, it, 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 these people might ask, I don't have any idea what the court is going to do. This piece of me that thinks uh, that there will simply be a 5-4 conservative ruling. I took some heart in uh, at the end of the argument that uh, Justice Kennedy seemed to have some real doubts about whether this was appropriate for the court to do. Um, but I sure hope that uh, those who have been doing it stop talking about liberal judicial activism and begin to think about conservative judicial activism, because that's what we've been seeing. Why have the, has the philosophy of Ayn Rand become po popular among Americans, even among American Christians? Um, well, it's obviously, the, the, it's very hard um, for uh, uh, American Christians to fully embrace Ayn Rand since she's an atheist, so it's, I, I assume that's the uh, inherent um, in the question. Um, I do find that disturbing, and in the book I talk about uh, how strange it is that um, uh, Christ, some of our Christian brothers and sisters, I'm a Christian, um, uh, seem to embrace radical individualism, which seems so antithetical uh, to the Christian spirit. It's actually uh, antithetical to the great American evangelical tradition. Evangelicals were central in the fight against slavery. William Jennings Bryan, many people know him because of the Scopes trial, but in fact he was an extraordinarily progressive American politician, an early advocate of women's suffrage, uh, an early advocate of the income tax, of railroad regulation, of all kinds of progressive um, reforms. Um, and I think that, um, uh, and I think that uh, some of what's happened is a, a sort of very much a, an individualistic emphasis within um, within certain styles of Christianity. I've often wondered, for example, uh, whether you learn something from whether someone says Jesus changed my life or Jesus changed the world. Uh, and I think in the first, you see a very much of an interior emphasis on individual salvation. The second is more um, social. Um, but I, you know, the book I keep on my shelf at home to remind me of what Ayn Rand really stood for is a book she wrote called The Virtue of Selfishness. Uh, and I think all Ayn Rand followers should be asked to do a disquisition on their belief in the virtue of selfishness uh, because that is what her philosophy at heart uh, is rooted in. And 
Um, I would commend to all conservatives who want to embrace her, uh, William F. Buckley Jr.'s great critiques of Ayn Rand back in the 1960s. No one was more critical of Rand than uh, uh, Buckley was. While we're on the topic of religion, let's turn to Catholicism. Now, are the Catholic bishops overstepping in their opposition to the Affordable Care Act provision of contraception coverage? Um, first of all, I feel uh, very uncomfortable answering a question about my church in a Presbyterian church down <laughs> town. Um, you know, and my instinct, I, you know, I'm a Red Sox fan thick and thin, and my instinct is always to defend my team when it's under attack and have the fights. But I've actually written publicly um, about this. Um, in the first round, I actually supported the church's view when, when uh, President Obama gave absolutely no um, uh, no accommodation uh, to religious groups, and notably the Catholic Church, on the contraception mandate. I was very critical of him because I thought uh, that in a pluralistic society that honors religious freedom and turns to religious organizations uh, for uh, uh, lots of forms of service, um, we should have reasonable accommodations to their views. Um, and secondly, I still don't like the way the underlying regulation um, is written because it suggests that um, the only, it, it suggests by definition that the only religious institutions are churches or places where you preach to your own, uh, when in fact uh, homeless shelters, hospitals, and all sorts of social services are very much people who are in them do it out of a religious conviction. Um, and so I, I, so to that extent I have sympathized with uh, the bishops. Uh, where I have part of company, um, with, not with the entire church, and my friends at the Catholic Health Association take this view, uh, is I thought that uh, President Obama's accommodation uh, was a reasonable step toward trying to balance the fact that the vast majority of Americans think it is reasonable and proper to have contraception uh, in their health plans, the fact that many of the people who work at the religious institutions don't necessarily share the religious conviction of that institution. Um, and I'd like to see um, more, uh, more cooperation between the bishops and the administration to try to work this through up to a satisfactory uh, conclusion. It was a good answer in a Presbyterian pulpit. Steve. What role do you think religion should have in American politics today? Um, boy, that's a, that's, a big, uh, that's a big question. Um, first of all, let me, let me talk a little bit about the book on that score. Um, because we act as if uh, religion's influence on politics is something entirely new, that it was invented by Jerry Falwell in 1979, um, when in fact um, religion has played a vital role pretty much since the Great Awakening in the 1830s. The Whig Party uh, was known at the time as the Evangelical United Front at Prayer. Uh, and many of the divisions between Jacksonian and Whigs were divisions along uh, uh, religious lines. Um, I think we go in phases on this. I do believe that a, a person of faith cannot help but have their faith influence their view of politics. I always confound people by saying I became a liberal because I am a Catholic, um, because of the church's social teaching, because of what it taught us about what Jesus said about the poor, uh, and reflecting more broadly in the uh, contemporary cr uh, Christian tradition on uh, what Reinhold Niebuhr wrote and what Martin Luther King preached. Um, and so I cannot deny anyone else uh, the right to base their uh, political convictions on or to have their, have their faith influence their religious convictions. I once said that to Ralph Reed in a debate that I, of the Christian Coalition that I would defend this right that he has, but he first, but he would have to explain to me where Jesus endorsed a cut in the capital gains tax, which I <laughs> could not find in my scripture. Um, but I also think, I, I think, A, we should, we should rule out religious prejudice as a reason for voting. I'm against, uh, you know, I, I think we've been through that often enough. Um, and I also uh, think that we go through phases that, um, you know, I, I suggest you think about the 1928 election, 1932 election. Um, in 1928, Al Smith's Catholicism was one of the central issues of the campaign, and the other was prohibition. Uh, uh, a split between wets who wanted to end prohibition and dries who wanted to keep it. And then a funny thing happened 
uh, on the way to 1932, it was called the Great Crash. And suddenly, the country is in an economic mess. And around that, t approaching the 32 election, a Democrat in Missouri wrote to Jim Farley um, that uh, he couldn't understand why a wet, wet Democrats were arguing with dry Democrats over liquor when neither could afford the price of a drink. Um, and so I think there are times for cultural politics and there are times for other kinds of politics. I think we're moving to some degree uh, to a, uh, a different phase. Um, but we are having a lot of arguments that touch uh, upon uh, moral convictions that are often rooted in religion. And I think it is normal uh, that people's religious convictions would affect that. And you're seeing it in the Christian church with different parts of the Christian church lining up on quite different sides of many issues, including gay marriage. In an earlier book, you suggested that the extremes in America have captured the debate. You said that people ought to come to the center to get things accomplished. Do you still feel that way? Well, if the center didn't keep moving right, I would be... Uh, um, the, <laughs> I, no, and I, I, I say that quite seriously, that, that uh, I am kind of temperamentally moderate, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and, um, I, and I do believe, as I say in the book, that I believe in this balance between public and private. I do not want state ownership of everything in our society, or even most things in our society. I believe in a, um, a state that helps take care of people and regulates uh, the market, but I also believe the market has benefits. I think that's a fundamentally moderate uh, view. Um, and I think that, uh, I write about this a lot in the book, that, and I didn't really talk about much in my talk, that uh, my biggest problem with conservatism is not conservatism itself, which I have a lot of respect for, but a movement of conservatism to a position far to the right of where conservatives used to be. Uh, when you think of uh, uh, Richard Lugar losing that primary in Indiana, for not being conservative enough. His lifetime conservative rating was 77%. If my math is right, that's more than three quarters of the way to the right, and yet he becomes a liberal. Um, it's a whole attitude toward government and government spending, uh, where a lot of uh, uh, conservatives used to uh, accept that sometimes you do have to raise taxes uh, to both balance the budget and provide for other programs. Uh, that great liberal Ronald Reagan did that, I think, 11 times. Um, and so I still believe in political moderation. I, I quote in the book, um, this is one of the only books you'll ever read that quotes uh, the late Senator Jacob Javits, a liberal Republican, at great length. I admire the progressive Republican tradition that you have seen in this state uh, in so many ways. So I still have great sympathy for moderation, but I think this moment requires a certain kind of opposition to a sharp drift to the right, uh, so we can get back to a point where we can talk about uh, moderation. Who's going to win the 2012 presidential election, <laughs> and why? Um, I suppose you shouldn't talk about betting in a church, uh, but <laughs> I, if I were to bet now, I would be still bet on President Obama, but I wouldn't give the odds I would have given a couple of months ago. Um, the, I, I think that he has certain structural advantages uh, in the Electoral College. I've been struck that even in the midst of 8.2% unemployment, he's been able to hang on to quite an extraordinarily large uh, base of support. I think what one thing that President Obama has in common with President Reagan, indeed, is a very strong political base uh, that's there. Uh, but um, the uh, events in the economy over the last couple of months complicate that. I think Governor Romney has recovered more quickly from that, we'll call it extremely interesting Republican primary, than uh, people uh, anticipated. Um, so I think it's going to be a very close campaign. The other thing is um, uh, President Obama won with 53 percent in a year that could not have had circumstances more favorable to Democrats outspending John McCain by a very substantial amount of money. So, um, you know, so I think that points to uh, an election that's very close in which most voters are uh, committed with a very small number of undecided voters. And lastly, Angela Merkel may have more effect on this election than either President Obama or Mitt Romney, and we're going to see what happens in Europe. What about today's decision of the children of illegal immigrants, allowing them to stay in the U.S.? Is that a, a good political move? I think, it, first, it's a good, it's a good move uh, on the grounds of justice, and it's good for the country. The, uh, and 
I, um, you know, and I think a lot of, even Americans who are uh, more restrictionist in their views of immigration, um, I think look at the children, uh, children who are brought to the United States by their parents. It's not as if they made an affirmative decision uh, to cross the border uh, on their own. Um, and so many of these, these, the folks affected by this have such, so much uh, to contribute to our country. Um, I still like, I'm, I, I'm told it's a legend, but I always like the story that uh, Franklin Roosevelt spoke to the daughters of the American Revolution and began his speech, fellow immigrants. Um, <laughs> and um, it says something about us. Um, and I think it will, uh, it is much more likely to help him than hurt him politically because it's not a radical move. Uh, but it is finally doing something on the question of immigration where action has been blocked for uh, three or four years. We have time for one final question. This one's from a student in the audience. What advice do you have for the upcoming generation on how to live out the balance of individualism and community, not just now, but for decades to come? Shouldn't you ask that of your preacher here? Uh, isn't that his? It's Sunday more morning, guidance, 10 o'clock, be here. The, um, um, I, in, in a sense, I, it's an old Jesuit saying, do what you were doing. Um, because the reason I uh, so admire uh, your generation uh, is because uh, you are more practical than the 60s generation and you are more idealistic than the 80s generation. Now these are all big cliches, but since I'm kind of pandering to your generation, I thought you wouldn't mind. Um, but I, and I think that um, what you're seeing in your generation is a struggle. How do I lead a rewarding personal life, uh, you know, professional life, um, without completely losing my personal and family life and without completely losing track of my obligations uh, to the community. So many of you have, as I said earlier, uh, done so many forms of service, engaged with people very different from you uh, in communities very different from your own. Uh, and I don't ever want you to lose that spirit. We often associate that kind of openness uh, with youth. Um, but I always like uh, Robert, and I suppose I'll close with this, that uh, we should always think of it the way Robert Kennedy did when he said, now is a time for youth, uh, not a time of life, but a state of mind, a quality of the imagination, a preference for adventure over the love of ease. Uh, and I think you should stay young in that way. But thank you all very, very much. Thank you.